right, shall we go ahead and get started? Sure. Welcome, welcome hey, oh, to hi. everyone and good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, this is the virtual uh, book launch for uh, Household Economy at Wall Ridge. And I'm Reva Rausch. I'm the acquisitions editor for the University of Utah Press. And I'm being joined today by Hannah New, who's our sales and marketing manager. And um, I'm also a shout out to Glenda Cotter, the director of the press that I see in the audience. Uh, okay, I'm going to introduce um, the authors and uh, I wanted to let you know that this is the cover of the book. Um, so we have Stephen Lenzik, he's the Associate Director of the Office of State Archaeology and Adjunct Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Iowa. Uh, we have Joseph Tiffany, a Professor Emeritus and former Executive Director of the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center at the University of Wisconsin, La Crosse. And we have Shirley Shermer, uh, adjunct research associate at the Office of the State Archaeologist and former director of the burials program for the Office of State Archaeologist, University of Iowa. Uh, the format for this uh, event today will be that we will have the three uh, co-volume editors speak about the book. And at the end of the presentation, um, we're happy to do questions and answers. Uh, there is, if you're familiar with Zoom, there's a chat box on Zoom at the bottom. Um, feel free to shoot us any questions that you might have for the uh, volume editors. And we're going to allow about 15 minutes for uh, questions and answers at the end. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, go ahead and turn it over to Shirley to get us going. Shirley? Um, the, the Wall Ridge site, um, you can see in Steve's background, um, the Luss Hills and the Missouri River Valley uh, floodplain. And the site is, was, lo was located on a kind of side slope, um, bench-like, uh, gently sloping landform, um, about partway right behind approximately where Steve you see Steve. <laughs> um, the initial um, discovery of the site was uh, Mike Perry, I think is on here somewhere. Um, during the initial um, archeological um, survey for uh, a local road project, which is just at the base of the Lus Hills along the edge of the, the floodplain. Um, but because this, it was for a local road project uh, the site did not qualify or the county was not required to conduct a full phase three excavation for the site, even though it was definitely potentially a significant site. Um, but Dwayne Anderson, who was the state archaeologist at the time, uh, worked out an agreement with the Mills County Engineer's Office, and they provided a, approximately $5,000 for um, a five-week excavation before the site was going to be destroyed. Um, if you look at the acknowledgement section in the front of the book, uh, there's a long list of people who uh, we had to acknowledge because without all the volunteer effort, um, this project would not have taken place. Um, we had uh, the Mills County Engineer's Office did provide surveying assistance. They provided uh, heavy equipment, um, USDA, provided some soil survey or soil experts. Um, the Iowa Archaeological Society provided um, help sponsor a field school and we had many, many volunteers that spent anywhere from a day to the whole um, time we were out there. Um, so, and professional volunteers who helped with the excavation as well as uh, the ongoing analysis of, of all the material that, that um, we were able to recover from the site. Um, the site dates to approximately um, AD 1297 to 
1306, and Steve will probably talk more about the dating of the site. Um, the, the field work, um, we, we decided to go with a three-stage um, plan. And the first stage being um, mechanical excavation of like, an eye trench, a very long or a longer north-south trench and then shorter east-west trenches at either end of that long trench. And the, um, that north-south trench was the most productive. We actually were able to um, identify the hearth, um, one of the central support posts and um, evidence for two storage pits. Um, we made the decision to excavate um, from the ground surface to the, the bottom of the pits um, uh, in doing hand, hand excavation levels, um, screening, and um, then taking samples, soil samples for subsequent uh, um, water screening and flotation. Um, you know, at the time we felt that that was probably the west half of the house, it turned out to be not quite the west half, not quite a half, but um, we were able to recover a great deal of material, excellent preservation. Um, and like I said, we had took the soil samples for, for later water screening and, and uh, flotation. That was the second phase of the, the field work. And then the third phase um, in the last few days of the, the field work, um, the county provided a, first a bulldozer to remove the overburden, taking it down to um, about the, the level of uh, where we had the house material. And then um, a grader came in. All of this was monitored by, by myself, by volunteers. Um, and um, because of time constraints, we were not able to screen all the house fill. Uh, we were able to screen the uh, and recover material from storage pits that were identified. Um, in total, we were able to um, identify three of the four um, central posts, um, I think 16 wall posts, in total nine sub floor storage pits and um, the edges, at least partial edges of the lodge basin itself. Joe was the um, principal investigator. I was the um, field director. Um, the subsequent lab processing, we were able to do some lab processing. Um, one of the local um, individuals um, provided a pole building where we were were able to set up um, an infield um, lab and do some of the, the water screening there. The rest of the material was brought back to um, OSA for um, processing. And uh, um, trying to think what else. Oh, one one little bit of information that uh, um, you know I mentioned the the massive volunteer effort. Um, the, the total excavation budget for this five week um, endeavor was $6,446 total, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, also while we were out um, during the, the field excavation itself, um, Iowa Public Bra Broadcasting was um, producing a, um, a film on the Lus Hills. And so they came out and uh, we, we're, we have a little bit featured um, in that um, film production. So uh, let's see, what else was I gonna cover? Oh, uh, the beginning, you know, the, the discussions prior to the actual excavation, um, you know, there were several questions that we wanted to be able to address um, that, um, that hopefully we would find enough evidence to, to be able to at least answer partially. And that was occupational duration, seasonality of use, uh, economic subsistence activities, um, 
the size of the residential group and re possible reasons for abandonment. Um, what else? Ah. Lab, um, lab processing, like I said, all of this or most of it was done by volunteers, but in terms of the actual um, cataloging and analysis of, of the material that was recovered, um, 60,000 specimens. Um, and that included <laughs> I can't find the numbers now, but anyway, um, excellently, excellently preserved final material, floral material, um, lots of ceramics, um, bone tools, stone tools, um, pipes, both stone and, and uh, ceramic. Um, so a great deal of material that, uh, that was recovered. And uh, even though the excavation and field work took place 1984, the researchers who continued volunteering their time, analyzing material, incorporating it into um, modern um, questions and um, new techniques that were developed over the years. Um, it really provides um, interesting view, um, I would say important in view um, within the context of current research. And I'll let Stephen and Joe can address more of this. So I will turn it over to one of them, whichever one Steve. wants to go first. <laughs> Steve. Joe, you want me to start next? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to follow up at a couple of Shirley's points. Uh, this project involved 123 separate individuals in field uh, technician positions and laboratory and analysis positions. That's before it got to the University of Utah Press. Um, so this was a collaborative effort that involved a huge number of people at all levels of uh, field work and uh, laboratory analysis. Um, secondly, I'd, I'd like to say a little bit about uh, the, the one particular project that I was involved with um, rather solely, and that was the radiocarbon dating of the site. Um, as Shirley pointed out, this site was narrowed down to at a one sigma range of about six or seven years. Uh, to do this, we had to run multiple AMS dates, pool the dates and average them. Uh, one of the outcomes of, this, of the dating process was that we discovered um, that uh, residues on ceramic sherds do not always provide a reliable date. This has been used quite a bit, in, particularly in the Eastern United States and in the, in the Midwest, it does not apparently work well in the plains. Uh, the one date that we tested this on ran about 70 years earlier than all of the dates that were obtained on single seeds from cultigens. Um, so there's a reliability problem that we think is due to what is called the freshwater reservoir effect. And it arises from using fish as a primary source of food in cooking vessels uh, where the fish derive from uh, fresh water sources that are high in carbonates and bicarbonates. Uh, so uh, among the very many specific things that this project did was to refine the dating process for a lot of the Central Plains. Uh, Donna Roper, an archeologist who worked, has worked in the Central Plains for many years, uh, now deceased, uh, had pointed out this as a potential problem um, in dating. Uh, she felt subjectively from her from our uh, analysis of previous dates gathered from other Central plain sites where residues were uh, used. Here we had a real quantitative way to say that freshwater um, reservoir effect is real and that it's probably gonna give you res uh, residue dates 
an offset by in the range of 50, 60, 70 years, somewhere in that amount. So those of you that might be considering doing residue dating, be careful if you're, if you're using uh, samples from the uh, planes. Um, the third thing that I was involved with um, was refining techniques that were originally developed by Joe Tiffany uh, for determining the duration of which uh, sites are occupied. In this case, we had a single lodge occupied by 15 people. And we were able to determine the number of people based on the floor area of the lodge and, and using a, a relationship established by Walter Wadel uh, based on ethnographic groups on the Great Plains. Um, but we really wanted to know how long the lodge was occupied for a number of reasons, which I'll, I'll get to it a little bit. We used three independent methods, largely independent methods for determining how long people lived in the lodge. And uh, the results we came up with varied between 4.0 years and just a little over five years with an average of 4.7 years or roughly um, four years, nine months. Um, and you might say, well, aren't you being more accurate than you really could justify the results? Uh, we don't think so. It's very much in this range of a very short occupation of a lodge, a few years, four or five years, roughly. Um, this is very counter to the uh, general prevailing um, opinion that lodges were occupied until they fell down or burned. Uh, in this case, this lodge had not burned, but it was abandoned probably while it was still architecturally stable. Um, so in this case, abandonment had to do some, with some other strategy, presumably uh, resource depletes, depletion and movement to another area where uh, uh, people could essentially start over with a new lodge. So even though a lot of effort was invested in, in building this lodge, it wasn't lived in for the total time that the lodge was architecturally useful. Um, the ways that we um, arrived at this um, were uh, in some ways familiar with the work that Joe had done earlier and other people had done for, for determining duration of occupation of a site. But I think we pioneered uh, a number of new methods uh, one of which that uh, Joe contributed to as part of his ceramic analysis um, uh, involved two different ways to determine how many vessels are broken at the site and then use ethnographic rates at which vessels are typically broken in formative societies. And um, this, is a, this is a tricky process because uh, you have to figure out, first of all, how many broken vessels you recover from the excavation, and then what that represents out of the entire assemblage. So that will give you the total number of vessels that were broken and discarded at the site across the entire site. And I noticed that Mike Perry is uh, joining us today. He was both one of the contributors to this volume, but he was instrumental in providing the data that we needed uh, for these calculations. Before we did the um, excavation that Shirley directed, Mike Perry went into the field and did a systematic testing of the site across a much larger area, which gave us the density distribution data that we needed to calculate the entire size of the assemblage of all artifacts at the site across an area about 100 meters across, well outside the lodge. Um, the artifact density drops from the center of the large out to about 50 meters exponentially. We were able to fit an exponential curve to the data that Mike was able to uh, produce as a result of his field testing. And, and a simple um, integration of this curve across an, an annulus going out to uh, 50 meters was able to yield the entire uh, size of the assemblage for the site. Um, and that, in coupled with the um, total number of vessels that uh, Joe recovered from the project, we were able to calculate a uh, duration of occupation. Uh, the second major method that we used for determining uh, duration of occupation was to figure out how many uh, days or years a population of 15 could be supported on all foods acquired from all 
uh, of the major resources available to them, both agricultural and uh, wild foods. So we compiled a list of, um, first of all, all of the uh, various animals and plants. Uh, Jim Thieler identified 126 different species of animals from the site of which about 125 of those, plus or minus a few, would have been eaten. Some of these were uh, snails that just crawled into the lodge and, and were there, but were probably not food resources. So 125 species of plants, uh, roughly 38 different species of, I'm, I'm sorry, of animals, 38 different species of plants. Um, and then we were able to calculate the storage capacity of the, of the lodge based on the size of the storage pit and using ethnographic data such as um, uh, Buffalo Bird Woman's accounts of her Hadatsa uh, gardens. So from this, we arrived at a figure of uh, approximately 58 um, uh, million uh, kilocalories available from all food sources during the 4.7 years that the lodge was occupied. And if you divide that by the number of uh, calories that 15 people use, you end up with about 4.5, 4 4.6 uh, years. Um, so this involved a, a, a lot of calculations, <laughs> a lot of work, and um, I don't know, a good third of the book is just devoted to uh, aspects that have to do with the duration of the lodge and the number of uh, 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 subsistence uh, activities that were undertaken and the total number of calories that you could drive uh, from that. So um, the, I, I think that that this thing just went beyond anything that's ever been done with any single lodge um, that's ever been occupied in terms of how we push the data as far as we could. I, I'm sure there will be people that will criticize this work to say we pushed the data too far uh, and uh, but I hope people take a careful look at it and uh, uh, give it the thought that we gave it uh, in terms of uh, coming up with the conclusions that we did. So, um, Jay, do you want me to turn you over to you at this point in time? You want to talk about some of the me? works you did? Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks, Steve. One thing Steve didn't mention was he analyzed the mud bugs. Remember that? <laughs> The, uh, the crawdads, which our colleagues Jim, Jim Thiele, when he did the comprehensive analysis of the fauna, confirmed Steve's identifications. So there you go. <laughs> uh, I want to mention a couple of uh, neither Jim or Bill Green are on, right? Connected to us? Yep. Bill is. I see him. Bill is. Well, let Bill, we'll let Bill talk about the, the plants, and I'll mention the, the work Jim and I did. Uh, Jim Thieler is one of those rare birds in archaeology who's an um, archaeofaunal expert, not just in bones. I mean, every critter out there, uh, in addition to uh, mollusks, snails, fish, snakes, you name it. Uh, so we had somebody who, who was an authority who could analyze the vast array of faunal material we got from this site. It was just Remarkable what he found. What's that say? Oh, something flashed on there. Um, with the, uh, the the shell and um, uh, bone tools, a couple of surprising things. Uh, I would go through and sort out the tools by type, and then Jim would look at them and identify the critter that was involved, uh, the bones from which the critter was made. Jim comes down one day and says, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> he had found a fish gorge, little tiny item artifact that was used to uh, catch fish. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that was at this site. It's just colossal. Another one of Jim's great adventures was, come up here and look at this. <laughs> uh, he had discovered that many of the uh, freshwater mollusks had a uh, uh, residue goo on there that was not part of the periostracum of, of the original shell. It was something added on. Uh, they were using those shells not only for scrapers and making uh, shell spoons and other items, but they're using them, we call them applicators, shell applicators. They're dabbing a, a mixture of, of uh, dye and uh, vegetal materials to tan hides. That was wholly new. Nobody had seen this tool before. Uh, that's the kind of uh, 
recovery that was available at Wall Ridge because of the detail we went into in getting stuff out of the ground. Uh, uh, Bill can talk uh, about the plant side, but from the, the critter side, on a remarkable range of birds, uh, the fish were interesting, thousands of little fish. They were like, probably in the, in the spring when food was short, uh, they were saning for minnows basically and making some kind of uh, nasty food. But anyway, uh, these are items that you just don't usually see in a report. Now, we did find some things that are very uncommon on Central Plains sites, but had not been reported from Iowa sites yet. One of them, I mentioned the, uh, the freshwater, uh, the mud bugs, the crawdads. The other was uh, eggshell. We had a part, I believe it was a goose, Steve. Was that correct? Uh, yes, I think so. Yes. Uh, the preservation of this site was phenomenal. Just phenomenal. And it has a lot to do with uh, the lust uh, setting, but geez, I mean, shell? <laughs> it was, it's remarkable. Um, with the, uh, the bone tools, in addition to the... Uh, these applicators, there's a, a typical range of Central Plains artifacts, awls, punches, that sort of thing. Um, with the, um, what was I going to mention? Oh, the, uh, the pottery, there is only like 317 rims or something like that, and a few thousand body shirts. There wasn't a lot there, which kind of goes in with the modeling Steve's talking about, because calculating it two or three different ways, it comes out, no matter how you do it, a short occupation. So um, I think that's important too. The, uh, the pottery, uh, there are, there's a couple of red slip vessels. Uh, there's a, a high uh, necked uh, water bottle. Uh, the, uh, the red slipping is really late on this site, but it probably reflects uh, contact uh, with uh, Caddo speaking peoples rather than with uh, the big site of Cahokia, which by the time uh, uh, Wall Ridge was occupied, uh, Cahokia was in decline. So the contact with the site, even though if you look at a map, where Wall Ridge is at, it's kind of like this little pimple <laughs> way out on the on the far eastern edge of Central Plains archaeology. But it is very typical of what you find in Nebraska, northern Kansas, um, and I think that's good. Uh, it gives you an idea of what's actually out there if people had time to uh, go back and excavate one of these sites now. Maybe Dale can talk about that because he was involved in salvage archaeology when Steve and I were in high school. Anyway, uh, so the artifacts are are pretty impressive in and of themselves. And one of them is a um, minnow-sized fish that's on the cover of the book, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, yes. it is. Uh, and that's been kind of the icon for this site since it was recovered. So... That's kind of what's going on with the artifacts. Since Mike's online, he can talk about the the uh, stone tool assemblage, and certainly Bill can uh, ought to weigh in right now on on the, what the what was found with the plants as well. Bill, no Bill. He's got a speaker. All right, him. there he is. Hi, Bill. <laughs> Over to me now, I guess. Hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun to uh, work on the plants from this site. Um, and uh, we involved some students during the identification, during the processing identification process. Um, don't want to go into a whole lot of detail, but the, uh, the, the most interesting thing that, uh, that I think we found in the, um, in the plant assemblage was all the seeds of little barley which is this plant that was, was one of the um, cultivated and domesticated native crops of North America. Uh, there were a handful of these um, that were very important before corn ever appeared on the scene and continued fairly important uh, for several hundred years after uh, corn arrived and eventually took over as far as economic importance goes. But little barley was great because it is, um, 
uh, it ripens in a very particular uh, at an important time of year in the uh, in the late spring, late May to June, which is a good seasonal indicator for site occupation and and uh, um, utilization as well. Uh, this was the first site. Walridge was really the first site back in the. Um, when did we start working on it? <laughs> back in Dawn the of 80s. time. <laughs> uh, it was the first site. Mary Adair really pioneered the use of a refined ethnobotanical um, uh, techniques in the Central Plains. And this was the first site um, along the Missouri River in, in uh, Southwest Iowa that utilizes very fine scale flotation. And the first site at which little barley was recovered. So we make kind of a big deal of it in the, uh, in the chapter, in the book. And in fact, the only illustration that you'll see in the, uh, in the chapter about plant remains is this wonderful scanning electron micrograph of a, uh, of a big juicy little barley seed uh, blown up about a zillion times. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, and, and the, the plant remains as, as Steve pointed out, were very important in trying to figure out the overall um, economics of the of the household, um, where they got their protein and calories from, uh, how much from corn, how much from other plants, and uh, uh, so it was it was really nice to integrate the plant remains into the whole rest of the of the analysis. That's my story. Sticking to it. <laughs> Um, I have just a, a couple of comments um, that I should have made earlier, but I didn't want to go into too much detail. As part of the dietary analysis, we extensively use the data on stable uh, isotope analysis that have been done on uh, two other Central Plains um, groups. Um, and they're closely related and probably contemporaneous with the um, occupation of the Wall Ridge site. Uh, one of these are from the Steve Kisker phase and um, the other one is from, oops, just forgot. <laughs> I'll think of it. Uh, St. Uh, Helena. St. Helena, uh, thank you. Uh, al although we didn't actually have stable isotope data from uh, the Wall Ridge population because uh, uh, there were neither any human remains nor would it be appropriate in Iowa to, to use them for this purpose. But we were able to use uh, data from, from Nebraska and, and nor northeastern Missouri and, or excuse me, Kansas, and to really fill in the dietary information using projections based on real data from related groups. So while we were able to um, archaeologically recover a lot of osteoarchaeological data and archaeobotanical data, there is still a missing component of the diet, which is not reflected in either one of those two assemblages. And to do that, you have to be able to have a stable isotope data that you can use to um, really provide what is essentially a projection based on the data you've got to define how much in the way of a, a C4 plant um, C4 foods and C3 foods uh, are missing from the diet. Uh, and those are the two major photosynthetic pathways in plants. And um, as some of you may know, um, maize is a C4 plant. And so it contributes um, its particular um, signature to the stable isotope data. And uh, most other plants with a few exceptions are C3 plants. And bison are one of those uh, uh, food sources, protein sources, uh, that can be predominantly C4. Uh, bison graze on both C3 and C4 plants, and it depends on where they graze on the Great Plains as to how much they're getting of each one of those uh, plants. Uh, so we, we were able to also get uh, stable isotope data from bison bones, not from the site, but again from uh, the central plains closest to the site from eastern and central Nebraska, which really gave us a good idea of what the C3, C4 composition of the bison would be at the, um, at, at the, at the Wall Ridge site. Um, I don't think that uh, Jim Thieler is on right now, but I will have to um, mention that uh, despite the fact that we had 123 people working collaboratively, there's 
bound to be some disagreement. And uh, one of the points of disagreement, uh, which uh, kept coming up, and I, I think we resolved it as best we could by giving everybody a little bit of credit, was uh, how many bison were actually um, killed, butchered, and utilized at the Walridge site. And it depends on which of the uh, bone remains you consider as uh, appropriate to use in uh, calculating the minimum number of individuals killed and utilized. And uh, there were some of us that felt three was the answer and there were some people that felt one was the answer. Uh, I'm not gonna say which ones. Uh, sort of for most of the analysis, the people favoring the three uh, won out, but I'll give deference to those that uh, favored the one. Uh, so at, at any point in time in a project like this, especially when you're uh, just crunching numbers left and right, uh, it's, it's all still based on the data at the very bottom of the pile. Um, and as my, my wife, Lynn Alex, says, tends to say, archaeology is a, really a house made of cards. If you pull one of the cards out or, as a false assumption, the rest of the stuff comes tumbling down. Uh, so we, we do the best we can under the, under the circumstances. That reminds me, I, I should mention uh, regarding the subsistence base at this site. Uh, another thing that we, the geniuses, went around and around about was uh, with the length of occupation. In my estimation in Thieler, this was a, a rich uh, a feast famine diet. So by early spring, they're out of food. Uh, that's why they're saning for minnows. Uh, they're, they're scrounging for a little barley. They're, they're looking for things to eat. And this plays into the uh, the available uh, protein from deer and bison that might have been at the site at one time. What we did find out though, is that Wall Ridge isn't really any different in composition from sites that were dug 80 years ago by Waldo Wado and others on the uh, Upper Republican uh, in the South Central Nebraska and Northern Kansas. Same kind of, uh, Wado made the same kind of observations in terms of what they were doing how short the sites were, uh, how ephemeral the housing was. Uh, so what we were finding again is not in one level radically different than what's been reported for a long time. What's different here is the uh, computational and qualitative anal and quantitative analysis that went into putting some numbers to these kinds of basic observations. Uh, let me follow up on Joe's here. Uh, because I think I have the numbers in my head. 53% of the, excuse me, 53 of the calories uh, came from maize and 38% of the calories uh, came from animal sources of which the predominant um, animal um, was the bison, uh, followed closely by deer and then elk. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is that while there were hundreds if not thousands of fish remains if you count things that were unidentified. Mm -hmm. They only constituted 1% of the diet for the entire year. Yet, as Joe pointed out, that could be the critical 1% in the late winter and, and early spring as to whether you starve or not. So many of these uh, really diverse resources I suspected came into play when other resources failed. And this is the thing that we really can't address as it, we know something about the seasonality of, of some of these resources, but many of them are available year round. And so uh, which ones came into play in the spring? Uh, we have a little bit of idea. A uh, little barley is a, a good example of a, of a sort of mid to late spring, maybe early summer uh, crop that would be available long before uh, other uh, traditional crops like maize and, and uh, other plants would be available. But, uh, you know, we, we suspect because of the diet breadth that it reflects more than people eating things that they just want to eat because they think they're tasty. They, we think they're eating them because they absolutely have to at certain times of the year uh, to, to really stave off starvation. Everything went into the pot. <laughs> What was available you ate. Uh, is, is Mike still on? He might want to talk about the lithic analysis. See? There? Mike? Uh, 
There he is. Hi, Mike. Greetings. Uh, you know, I my contribution to lithics was um, not as extensive, perhaps, as Toby Morrow's, who had started out on the lithic analysis uh, some years before I became involved. Uh, um, uh, and he got to look at all the tools, and he did a very good job with all of that. Uh, um, he also looked at a sampling of the of the debitage such, uh, uh, but left the majority of it. And uh, that's what I got to work with, a lot of the debitage. Uh, uh, and, uh, um, well, I will say, uh, uh, well, Toby and I didn't uh, agree on all of the raw material identifications. What we, between the two of us, came up with is probably the most extensive uh, uh, analysis of lithic raw materials of uh, any of these central plains sites uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, um, and we found um, uh, lithic raw materials being utilized from all across the central plains, uh, all the way up into North Dakota with the Knife River Flint, uh, um, the Bijou Hills from South Dakota, that sparkly greenish uh, ortho quartz site, they call it. Uh, um, uh, uh, and as a, a, a variety of materials also extending along Missouri River in central Missouri. So they're covering a lot of ground with their lithic raw, raw materials um, at this particular site. How it got there, we're not sure. Uh, some of it was brought with them from wherever they came before they arrived at Wall Ridge. Um, others were undoubtedly traded in one way or another through contacts with other Central Plains groups. So. Um, we were pretty pleased with those results, I think. Uh, By the way, one of the things that uh, Mike established as a result of his lithic analysis was that um, north eastern Kansas and southeastern Nebraska was an important area, especially around the hills, for lithic resources. And we also suspect that that may have been where uh, the bison procurement by the mm -hmm. members of the lodge was were taking place. I think this may be one that uh, a really good evidence for uh, people who were living in uh, really single household or, or multiple family single house lodges moving uh, extensive distances to procure bison. And it's very consistent with the osteological evidence we have, uh, which indicates almost no bone remains were brought, brought back. Uh, it was probably all um, Animals were defleshed and dried on the spot and just dried meat uh, returned to the lodge. Um, and that would explain why in many of these lodges uh, and similar traditions, the C4 um, amounts are so high because they're eating a tremendous amount of bison, but they're not obtaining them locally. They're traveling uh, distances. And it's, it's sort of also consistent with where bison with the highest C14 uh, values uh, sh should be found because that's where the greatest uh, C14 grasses are located. This is radically different from the Mill Creek culture, which uh, Dale Henning and I worked on and argued about. Uh, there the bison were available locally, by and large, or local herds. At uh, uh, Glenwood area, maybe a floater, uh, dead bison coming down the, <laughs> the Missouri in the spring, but otherwise uh, they would have quickly hunted out the deer and other large game, uh, even in the a resource rich area like Royal Ridge because it's so rugged. It's hard to move through that area and uh, do the kind of uh, anything other than single person hunting basically. So the idea that they were heading, um, heading west for other resources, uh, bison, raw materials and the like is, is not surprising. One of us, Steve, and it looks like it's going to be you because I'm pointing my finger at you, uh, uh, ought to talk about our, our paleoclimatic reconstruction because we went through several different models. And uh... Uh, yeah, actually, uh, uh, you know, there's been so much play of climate in past archaeological uh, writings, but unfortunately, uh, archaeologists sometimes don't have time to keep up with the uh, what climatologists are coming up with in terms of new models. Um, and they've, they've been really improved a lot, particularly in, since the 1990s, 
uh, just up until the last few years. And now it's pretty well agreed that the two major climatic episodes on the Great Plains are the uh, medieval climatic anomaly and, um, oops, um, help me out, Bill. Uh, oh, the Little Ice Age, Little Ice Age. Um, and uh, there's about a hundred year gap between the uh, medieval climatic anomaly and the uh, Little Ice Age. And uh, that 100 year gap is the gap where Wall Ridge falls. Uh, since we've been able to pin it down to really uh, 1300 um, AD. And uh, it, during that interval between those two major climatic events, uh, climate on the Great Plains appeared to be pretty much like it is today. I guess we could call it normal. Uh, no, no major climatic event. So there was nothing going on climatic wise uh, that would be any different from uh, the basic setting uh, of, of present day. And I think one of the things that I've always been interested in these Glenwood Lodges is that uh, which are considered sort of a commensal past and they're, and they're found considerably further south. So for many years, it was assumed that the climate was warmer, uh, warmer perhaps warmer and moisture that would in, induce uh, rice rats to uh, move north with the people and be incorporated into the diet. Well, in fact, I think what the deal is, is that uh, people, are, and since they are commensal, people are actually taking rice rats with them. Uh, they're much like the guinea pigs or the koi of, uh, of, of Peru, where people move from one lodge to the next, taking their population of rice rat with, with them, establish, establishing colonies in the lodge that become immediate food resources that you can just uh, you know, knock off a rice rat and, and eat it right on the spot. Uh, so I, I think we've been able to set, because we think the climate is normal, uh, we've been able to shed light on all sorts of things uh, which might previously have been thought to indicate um, climatic regimes. Steve, I think you probably meant that the rice rats were inadvertently brought into the homes, right? No, I think they were intentionally. You think? Uh, well, that's a, that's a matter of opinion. Yeah. I guess they could have traveled along with them, but rice rats don't move any distance at all. So unless you can whistle and have them follow you, which I don't think so. I think you'd actually have to put them in a little in the, middle of the right end of the lodge and dump them in the lodge, so. Like you know. your chihuahua bag, you know, yeah, just right. around. <laughs> a little bag of rice rats and you sort of seed the lodge with rice rats and let them take over, you know. Uh, I hope the people listening in realize we actually had fun doing this analysis, even though we occasionally sparred bitterly. It was a enjoyable experience to see several lines of uh, disparate information come together in not only the paleoclimatic model, but the, the faunal data supporting the, the floral analysis in terms of seasonality, all kinds of things. Uh, had, no, had no idea when we were out there in 1984, surely, did we? <laughs> uh, by the way, before, I turn, before we turn this over to Reba for questions, I do want to comment uh, the Dr. David Gradwell is online and he was my undergraduate mentor and uh, supposedly he's read the book and uh, maybe even completed his uh, review of it. So I'm hoping, uh, Dave, that you'll submit a question if you have one. Be nice, Dave. Be, be gentle. <laughs> we do have um, some questions that I would like to put to you guys. Um, I'm going to start one with Carl B. It says, with the short duration of occupation, any thoughts um, where this group would have come from and where they went, just a few miles away or a longer distance? The whole Glenwood occupation is an uh, extension out of uh, east, eastern Nebraska. So that's probably where they came from. The pottery is no different. I imagine that's where they went back. It's like a a splinter group. If you look at a map of the distribution, there's this bubble that's Glenwood and everything else is on the other side of the river by and large. So yeah, to elaborate on Joe just a little bit, this area around Glenwood in Iowa was occupied for about 100 years, um, maybe a little bit longer, but not much. And so this is but one of numerous lodges, well over a couple hundred lodges that were built during that period of time. And one of the things that we've been able to do is get, come up with a better population estimate once we know 
Um, and this is based on a larger study that we're working on currently with the 16 lodges in that area. All these lodges were only occupied for a few years. Uh, the average is about three, three and a half years for a lodge use. And once we know how long a lodge was occupied, we know the number of lodges, the number of people in each lodge, we can calculate the actual population size. And uh, it's, it's way less than 100 people living in this uh, Which area. Which is one, uh, one of our colleagues, Larry Zerman, for his doctoral dissertation at Kansas, uh, did a computer simulation and came up with the same result 40 years ago. A small number of people, a large number of houses, very short occupation. So it's nice to see a different uh, strand of information support uh, earlier modeling, I guess is what I'm getting at. So do you, that? you guys know one of, one of the interesting things about the, the large number of sites and the short occupation durations for each is that the assemblages, and I'm thinking mostly of the, of the plant assemblages, uh, vary quite a lot from lodge to lodge. And it's not because the people from one household didn't know about the plants that the other houses were using. It's just that whatever happened to be preserved over this relatively short period of time, you know, dropped into a storage pit or swept off the floor is what we end up finding today. So I think a lot of the variability that we see between the lodges is just due to sort of contingent historical factors that we have very little control over, with the upshot being that in order to get a good idea of the full range of resources used by these people, we really have to analyze a lot of lodges, right? right? Yes. And, and a lot of the early excavations did not do the water screening and, and flotation um, across the site that was done at Wall Ridge. Great, um, I've got a couple more questions. Um, could you further describe why the site was located where it was? Primarily its elevation as it relates to the floodplain, why there specifically uh, if it overlooks the plain but would also receive the worst of the winter winds? Uh, Steve, oh, you were me. I'll take a stab. Thank you, Mike. I'll bring back the <laughs> you know, again so we have an idea of what the environment looks like. There we are, yes. We, this is an area of earth lodges that are scattered over in about, say, nine miles north-south by three miles east-west there's hundreds of them over that area. Um, and they made use over the 100, 150 years that they were there. They made use of every scrap of practically level land that they could find. If you look around that area, if it's a level spot of any size, there'll be a house there. Um, so. That's one of the advantages of this particular location. It's a relatively level area. It's elevated, so it's off the floodplain. And it's not going to be subject to um, not going to be subject to flooding events that might be a problem if you were on a lower lying uh, landform. Um, but it's also got plenty of trees around it. There's going to be enough protection from those winter winds that come blowing across the Missouri bottom. So. Um, that's why I think that site was particularly uh, chosen. Uh, I would add one other comment. Uh, we have found a few lodges right um, on the edge of the Missouri floodplain up against the Las Bluffs. It's always possible that there could be lodges out, more lodges out on the floodplain and they're just buried. Uh, that's just a, somewhat of an unknown. We really don't know how much they may have used the floodplain and those lodges are gone. Uh, back to Mike's comment, uh, one of our colleagues did a, a, a basically a statistical a geographic model of the entire uh, Glenwood locality. And what she found is every one of these houses, whether on the ridge top or down the floodplain or kind of in between like a wall ridge, had access to the same resources. And one of those resources, as Mike pointed out, was tillable land to grow corn. They're all within close distance to the house. So 
you would think, well, why would someone on the upland, uh, wouldn't they have a different kind of uh, ecosystem to exploit? Well, maybe, but that isn't what they were doing. Uh, they were looking for specific things on this very rugged landscape that they could use. Uh, my, as my colleague Jim Thieler points out, the reason they had those sites up on the uplands was to get away from mosquitoes. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I kind of think he's right. But anyway, you, you can't prove that. But uh, uh, anybody else? Steve? All right. No, let's take another question. Yep. Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple more. Um, Knowing what you know now, if you could investigate the site again, what would you do differently? Spend a lot of money. (laughs) (laughs) Excavate the entire site and surrounding area. Yes. um, From the ground surface to the bottom of the lodge to the bottom of the pits, the entire site, rather than a portion. Correct. Surely, very judiciously sampled this lodge along with Mike's original survey and recovered way more than the small $6,000 of money we got. Uh, I mean, she did an amazing job of just getting essentially uh, 100%. I know everybody would wish you could excavate, re-excavate a site with more control, excavate more area, but it's a really, it's a, a phenomenal recovery uh, that uh, Shirley was able to instigate in the short amount of time and the short of, uh, little bit of money that she had. And lots of volunteers. Okay, we got one last question, but we're running out of time. So if you could answer this quickly, out of all the different methodologies that you used to investigate the site, which do you think was the most productive to your interpretations or understanding? Dietary analysis. Steve? Absolutely. I'll agree. I'll agree. Yeah, of course I will too. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend this event. I want to thank all of the speakers uh, for, you know, entertaining all of the questions and uh, bringing in people to answer our questions. Uh, It was a wonderful event and this book is for sale. It is out. Uh, Hannah has put up on the chat comments um, a a link for a discount on the book and free shipping. So if you're interested, that's there. Uh, Again, I want to thank everybody. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact any of the speakers or myself. Thank you so much. And uh, Thank you. you a good day. <laughs> bye bye, everyone. Bye. bye. bye.